When a depraved murderer escapes from prison. He had actually butchered the body, put it in, in bags and threw it in the Delta. The Bureau mobilizes. The goal is to eventually go from five days behind him to two days behind him to two hours behind him to catch him. The man is definitely a sick individual. I can't even call him a human being. Oh, this you. is one time I slept with a gun right next to my pillow. FBI. Criminal Pursuit. March 22nd, 1991. A man walks into the Winslow branch of the Valley National Bank and asks to speak with manager Stan Egan. He looked normal for Winslow. You know, he had a jogging suit on. The man tells Egan that he'd like to apply for a $25,000 loan to build a house. But Egan's not so sure about the deal. I just had an uneasy feeling about what he was talking about because he wasn't real clear on what he wanted to do. Egan senses something is off, but starts to fill out some paperwork. Bridge loan probably worked. You know what? I'm going to have to get. Uh, Suddenly, the man makes a startling move. And he reached in under his shirt, and my first thought was, man, don't come up shooting. Okay, just need. Well, he brought the 9 millimeter aimed it at me and said, we don't need to go any farther. I want $25,000. No alarm, no anything. Just I need $25,000. He says, don't call the police. He says, I don't mind going out in the blaze of glory, and you'll be the first one to go. A teller can see what's happening inside Egan's office and trips a silent alarm. Detective Elmer Hasse of the Winslow Police Department gets the call. The dispatcher advised me that she just got a report of a bank robbery in progress at the Valley National Bank. I learned at that point we only had one officer on duty. He was out of town. The detective races to the bank alone. Inside, Stan Egan is trying to stall the menacing robber. I don't want to go out. I told him that I didn't have any money at my desk. I'd have to get someone to get it. So I went to the door of my office and I asked my secretary to come in told her that I needed $25,000. The tellers scramble to gather $25,000 in cash. I had a uh, blue zippered uh, bank bag that I gave him. He put the money in there, put the money underneath his jacket, and he says, you're going with me. By now, Detective Hassey has arrived on the scene and can see Egan being held hostage. Detective Hassey has only a split second to decide what to do. I was totally nervous. Like I say, I was afraid that was the first man in my life I would ever have to shoot. Stan Egan has right, no okay. idea that the detective is hiding outside. When I got to the door, I just stopped. I pushed the door open. Ah, and as he walked by me, Detective Hassey grabbed him, pushed him against the wall by the sign that you can see. The detective cuffs the robber and takes control of the volatile situation. At that point, I reached around, I found a gun in his waistband and pulled it from his waistband. Detective Hassey disarmed him, put the gun on the ground, handed me the money bag, which I handed back to a customer that was right behind me. What we locked the doors. After that, everybody could relax. Detective Hassey books the robber into the Winslow jail. He's identified as 32-year-old Danny Ray Horning. Police do a little digging and find out Horning spent part of his childhood in Winslow. The son of a minister. But he's no choir boy. And has a history of tangling with the Winslow PD. He'd been arrested here at one time, but apparently after he left here and became an adult, he uh, considered himself a professional bank robber. So uh, he'd come back to Winslow on a vendetta to uh, 
get even with Winslow for arresting him several years prior. Further investigation reveals that Horning is wanted in several states. The list of his felonies is shocking. Several other police departments started notifying us that there were outstanding warrants on Danny Ray Horning. In Salt Lake City, Horning is wanted for bank robbery. In Idaho, he's wanted for the theft of a pickup truck. But that's not all. Horning's record includes one conviction for molesting his daughter. He is also a suspect in a particularly gruesome murder in Sacramento. They had an open murder case where he had actually butchered the body and put it in, in bags and threw it in the Delta. In May 1991, Danny Ray Horning is tried for the Valley National Bank robbery. The judge decides to lock him up and throw away the key. Danny Ray Horning was convicted in Arizona on four felony counts, and uh, he was sentenced to four life terms, four 25-year terms, to run concurrent. Because he was not going to get out of the state penitentiary. The sentence infuriates Horning. Danny Ray was very arrogant. He felt that he was better than everyone else. Everything that he wanted, he took. Horning makes it clear that he has no intention of spending his life behind bars. During his sentencing, Mr. Horning, with his arrogant ways, stated to the judge that uh, he didn't care if he gave him a thousand years, he'd be out in a year. Horning keeps his word. On May 12th, 1992, less than a year into his sentence, he busts out of the Arizona State Prison Complex in Florence in broad daylight. Using a stolen employee uniform and a fake ID, Horning impersonates a medical worker and walks out of the prison. Alarm bells sound. Department of Corrections officer Kenny Vance is one of the first to arrive on scene. Our security measures are very good, but when we do have an escape, this is what we respond with. We bring in hound teams from uh, all over the state. Vance and other DOC officers gather what's left of Horning's belongings. We recovered 10 articles early on from his cell at the uh, state prison in Florence, and they were bagged up and, and divided up for all the hound teams. They also interview inmates and learn that Horning carries a bitter grudge against law enforcement. Worried that Horning has escaped with a violent mission in mind, the DOC calls on the experts at tracking fugitives, the FBI. Phoenix-based special agent Keith Tolhurst takes the lead on the case. He has more than four years' experience hunting down dangerous criminals and suspects he knows where Horning might be headed. Everybody still goes back to their roots somehow. So if there's people that they've dealt with in the past, there's a good chance they'll try to get back to them again. Hundreds of FBI agents, SWAT, and law enforcement mobilize across the state and begin the hunt for Danny Ray Horning. They suspect the fugitive is making a beeline back to Winslow to settle old scores. One of the things we thought that Horning was going to do after his escape was go back to Winslow, Arizona, where he had committed the bank robbery. Right there, that's good. That's good. That's because in 1991, he sent a letter to the Winslow Police Department telling them that he would be out in a year and was coming back to see him. And that he blamed them, not the bank employees, for his lot in life. If the FBI is right, they may be able to capture Horning before he makes good on his threats. But if they're wrong, there's no telling what Horning could do. He's the type of person that was committed that he would be willing to die for what he wanted and had nothing to lose. So he was very dangerous because of those things.
It's been two days since Danny Ray Horning, a vengeful and vindictive bandit, broke out of a Florence, Arizona prison. Now the FBI is hot on his trail. Larry McCormick is the assistant special agent in charge of the FBI's Phoenix field office. He gets a lead that Horning robbed a house about 20 miles from the prison. He had broken into a house, stolen two guns, all of the information going to the other law enforcement uh, agencies was that he was armed and dangerous. Obviously added to our anxiety. Horning isn't seen again for days. Agent McCormick knows he's exceptionally dangerous. So the sociopath is what I would describe them. You know, they are outgoing, they're very aggressive, and they're very sure of themselves. And, and they will continue on to, to be aggressive. I think Danny Ray Horning fits that personality. Agents are particularly disturbed when they discover a link between the gun Horning used to rob a Winslow bank and a gruesome murder that occurred two years earlier. He kept the gun from that victim, and that gun was the gun that he used in the uh, Winslow bank robbery. So that helped connect him to the case as well. September 20th, 1990. A fisherman on the San Joaquin River hooks a garbage bag, opens it, and discovers something gruesome, a human leg. Over the next two days, sheriff's deputies find two arms bound by duct tape, a torso wrapped in a bedsheet, and a head. They also find a knife. The body is identified as 40-year-old Sam McCullough. The coroner determines McCullough died from a single 22 caliber gunshot to the forehead, fired from close range. His sister, Melissa, is devastated. It was just unbelief to me. I would have never thought that somebody would come to my door and tell me that my brother was dead. He was just kind, very kind. He would help people. He was just a good guy. Deputies learn that McCullough was a catfish farmer, known to keep large quantities of cash inside his house. Uh, my brother had a, a place out in Stockton, California. He basically did a lot of work around his own place. Investigators wonder if McCullough was robbed, then killed. And there's something else. McCullough had a soft heart and wanted to help out Danny Ray Horning. He hired the former convict to work at his house. He felt sorry for Danny Ray Horning, not being able to get employment because of his past history, prison and so on. Uh, my brother tried to help him out. McCullough's friendship wasn't returned. Fired? You're firing me? The relationship yeah, soured no, when Horning allegedly tried to rob McCullough. According to McCullough's sister, the two got into a heated argument shortly before McCullough vanished. Danny had threatened to kill my brother. He had threatened at a point that I will kill you. You don't understand. I mean, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Horning becomes a prime suspect in the case. Deputies search McCullough's home where they find bloodstains and another 22 caliber shell casing. They then search Horning's property, where they find the body of Horning's dog. He had shot his dog because he had had a bad day. Forensic tests reveal that the dog was killed by the same 22 caliber rifle that was likely used to murder Sam McCullough. 
Deputies believe that Horning shot McCullough, execution style. Butchered the body. And wrapped his remains in plastic bags before dumping them in the Delta. It was such a, a gruesome murder where he actually chopped up a body and, and put it in a tub and then threw it away where it couldn't be discovered. Horning is also believed to have robbed McCullough's home, taking cash and a 9mm handgun. But when police search for Danny Ray Horning, he's vanished into thin air. The man is definitely a sick individual. I can't even call him a human being or person. He had shot his dog because he had had a bad day. He molested his own daughter. I have no idea why he did it. I have no idea. And anybody that would molest their own child or any child or shoot your dog because you're having a bad day, who's to say why he did it it shattered our whole family's lives then nearly a year later the suspected murderer turns up in winslow arizona where he robs the valley national bank at gunpoint i don't have that I mean, the two of you just wait outside right where i can see you okay a check of horning's nine millimeter handgun reveals that it's registered to Sam McCullough, definitively linking Horning to McCullough's murder. When Horning is convicted and locked up in Florence, Melissa Cawthorn thinks her nightmare is over. Turns out, it's only just begun. Oh, when he escaped from prison, we got the phone call on that one too. I was, I was praying to God that Either he would not get a hold of somebody's child, or he would not kill somebody. He said he would not be taken alive. So, take him. We don't want him alive. It's been three weeks since suspected murderer and convicted bank robber Danny Ray Horning walked out of prison the fbi and local law enforcement are searching day and night playing a dangerous game of cat and mouse with the fugitive and there were over 400 federal state and local law enforcement officers and agents involved in the manhunt special agents keith tolhurst and larry mccormick are concerned that by now the fugitive has armed himself. You know, we definitely thought that Danny Ray was was violent. He had violent potential. He had committed acts of violence in the past, and we, we definitely felt that there was a possibility he could do it again. Horning is on the run, but he's hiding in plain sight. He brazenly approaches several campers in Flagstaff, Arizona. As he was sighted, for about a week straight, almost every day, just walking up to campers and asking them for water and food. He, he wasn't eating uh, berries and living off the land. He was just getting food from people that were there. But Horning doesn't stick around for long. When he sees forest rangers in the area, he steals into the woods, okay? leaving behind a backpack and a gun. Agents step up the chase. In these dense woods, scent dogs have the best shot of picking up his trail. On June 11th, DOC officer Kenny Vance sets out with 20 bloodhounds. Yeah, we had hounds from every uh, state prison in, in uh, uh, Arizona that had dogs. Uh, we were dispatched to uh, possible sighting areas and whatnot, uh, trying to cut a track, trying to cut a scent and uh, trying to work it to uh, a capture. They quickly pick up a trail that leads officers to a remote cabin. Inside, they find evidence that Horning has been there. Evidence he intentionally left behind to mock the FBI. And he actually left a note 
thanking the owners of the cabin for the use of the cabin and telling them the uh, to the FBI and the cops to quit chasing me. And he also added to go ahead and send my backpack to my folks. A truck was taken, and that truck, coincidentally, was a brown pickup truck. And one of our interviews previously with his brother was that he liked brown pickup trucks. The dogs are brought into the cabin, where they begin tracing Horning's next steps. Dogs started at that location and tracked him for about a mile. And within that mile, there were two more burglaries. The FBI and police are in hot pursuit of Horning. On June 20th, authorities spot Horning in the stolen pickup. He abandons the truck and flees into the forest. A sheriff's helicopter gives chase. But it's difficult to follow Hornet in the dense woods. Agents search the truck and find another patronizing note from Horning. Horning had apologized to the truck owner for driving his truck so hard over this rugged terrain and he felt that he had uh, abused the truck. As soon as the media gets wind of Horning's antics, they paint him as a kind of folk hero. The perception that the public had of Horning at the time was that he was a Rambo-type survivalist. We knew he was more of a uh, garbage picker for food and, and trying to hide that way. But agents know what he really is, a cold-blooded killer. And their fear grows as he continues to slip through their fingers. The more time that went on, the more frustration grew. And we're obviously very concerned with his criminal background that uh, he was going to commit some kind of heinous crimes on some innocent victims. It's been six weeks since suspected killer and bank robber Danny Ray Hornick Documentary TV escaped from an Arizona prison. Even as he taunts the FBI, they are close behind, determined to catch him. We considered him to be extremely dangerous just because of the violence involved in his crimes. Agents suspect he's seeking revenge on Winslow police for nabbing him during a bank robbery. Well, all this was happening, we notified the Winslow Police Department that there's a good chance that he was headed there uh, for some type of retribution against the police. The uh, chief of police was very familiar with it because of the previous threats made to the Winslow Police Department. The FBI joins forces with the Arizona Department of Corrections, the Department of Public Safety, and the Coconino County Sheriff's Office. They think Horning is hiding out in Flagstaff, but can't be certain. We had so many sightings and things that we couldn't confirm or deny. You don't know if those are actually there. They do know that the longer Horning's on the lam, the more desperate and dangerous he'll become. Obviously, a lot of criminals get more violent as they go. He had learned uh, a lot being in prison, uh, for the worse, obviously, and he was going to apply that. Horning is proving to be a formidable foe, able to survive in the toughest conditions. Northern Arizona is quite a wilderness up there in, in forest, and, and he was very successful in moving about and eluding law enforcement. He would show up here, he'd show up there, and, and we were never able to catch him. Then, Horning ups the ante. 
June 25th, 1992. Two co-workers at a Flagstaff fast food restaurant are getting into their car. Danny Ray Horning approaches and knocks on the driver's side window. Horning pulls a gun and forces the couple to drive 75 miles to the Grand Canyon. There, he makes them pay for a hotel room. Then he made threats to him about how he could hear the bed squeak and how he would be right at the door and he was a very light sleeper if they tried to escape. The next day, Horning forces his hostages to give him money and buy him high-tech camping gear. It's a matter of survival. And so they will do whatever it takes to maintain their life. And, and for that reason, they're going to cooperate with them. But by driving around the Grand Canyon, Horning is also showing his face. And the FBI catches wind of it. Campers had reported seeing an individual that matched his description, was coming up asking for soda, if he could have a free one, if he could buy a soda off him. And it was kind of unusual behavior for someone to do uh, repeatedly in a camp area. So it uh, let us believe that was, that was Danny Ray. Agent Tolhurst sends in undercover SWAT officers as bait, and he instructs the FBI's hostage rescue team to set up a perimeter around the area. We knew we needed more help than what we had, and they had the manpower and the skills where we could put them out into rural areas and set up uh, picket lines and possibly see if uh, Danny Ray would run into them while he's trying to maneuver through the woods. But Horning continues to evade them. He orders the couple to drive him through the park in search of more hostages that he can use as leverage. It's not long before he spies the perfect target. The Normans, a family of six from Texas. My family and myself were returning back home from vacation in California. We made a stop here at the Grand Canyon and little did we know what awaited us. The Normans pull up to a store to buy some snacks before they hit the road. My wife sent me off to a loaf of bread here at this store here. Right. Horning parks just out of sight. He threatens his hostages, telling them he'll kill people if they try to escape. He takes the keys with him and approaches Manuel Norman. On my way back out, is when he asked me, he says, uh, whose trailer is that? I said, the trailer belongs to my brother-in-law and the van belongs to me. He said, well, we're trying to get a, a travel trailer and we would like to look at it. Hi there. Uh, I told him, well, I'll have to ask permission from my brother-in-law so you can look at the trailer. Horning returns to the car and pulls up next to the trailer. Manuel gives Horning and his hostages a tour of the trailer while his family sits in the van. He, then he asked, he says, you know who I am? I said, no, we're from Texas. We don't know nobody from Arizona. I'm Danny Ray Horning. And I said, well, OK. He pulls out a weapon and he says, you guys are my hostages, all right? I said, no, you are kidding me. I said, I got to go to work next week. And he cocks the gun. Horning orders Manuel family. to get the rest of his family out of the van and bring them into the trailer. Manuel's son exits the van. His father calls him over, but the kid sees Horning's gun. The chaos broke loose because everybody's going different directions. I'm, I'm going after him. My wife is coming out of the van. The other people are going around the back of the trailer, and everybody's going everywhere. I started praying, you know, I don't know what's going on, but dear Lord, bring us through this, and please don't let anything happen to us. The boy takes off running towards some forest rangers who have heard the commotion. Horning orders his hostages into the back seat and speeds away. The hostages to me were scared 
traumatized. They were, I'm gonna say like zombies. Authorities are just minutes behind. They followed me. When the sirens, the helicopters, all of that started happening, they all descended and started looking for him. The park ranger races after him, but Horning speeds past him in the opposite direction. The ranger makes a sharp U-turn, and the chase is on. Gary Horning is trying to run uh, with the uh, two victims in the car with him and starts shooting out the vehicle at the park ranger. Horning drives wildly, firing a 44 caliber Magnum through the window at the pursuing officer. He barely misses his two hostages in the back seat. Once that occurred, the park service backed off a little bit, but obviously Danny's still trying to get away. Suddenly, the road ends. Horning ditches the couple's car just minutes before rangers close in. By the time they caught up to his car, the two victims were still there, but Danny had already fled out into the woods. Horning has disappeared into the 1900 square miles that is the Grand Canyon. The canyon provided all kinds of challenges, wilderness, trails, hiking areas, and a lot of these weren't marked, so we had to get maps and so forth, and it was quite a challenge. The park ranger realizes he's on the trail of Danny Ray Horning when he finds two frightened hostages inside yeah, yeah. a car, along with a haunting message to Winslow PD. I'm with Danny Ray coming at you. You are the club place, Winslow Police Department. I'm going to let you know that anything goes wrong here, you better hope I don't survive it. Because if I do, I'm coming for you. Horning claims to have six hostages. For your safe return of these hostages, you will have to meet the requirements that I'm going to verbally on this tape. Horning demands that his brother Jerry, a convicted child molester like Danny Ray, be released from prison and that he bring ransom money to Winslow. He wanted a million dollars, and if he didn't get that, he was going to have six hostages, and he'd kill half of them if he didn't get it. You have until June 30th at 3 p.m. to have both my brother and the money sitting on a brand new 4x4 pickup Love in color. Agents know that Horning is bluffing. He no longer has any hostages. Still, they worry he'll make good on his threats against law enforcement. You know, I'm gonna start sniping off your lawyers, cops, judges, DAs, whatever I can get a, my sight from, I'm taking out. But I have no limitations, nor do I have anything to lose. It's obvious that Horning thinks his plan is airtight. Danny Ray definitely had a belief that he was more intelligent than everybody and that the reason he hadn't been caught in a couple of weeks was because law enforcement was incompetent. And I think you should take a needle point because you're a hell of a biopracker. And for now, it does seem like Horning has the upper hand. Uh, I think he was lucky. Uh, given the area that we were in, the geographics and stuff made it very, very tough on us. But the Grand Canyon is an unforgiving place. And the FBI and other agencies are flooding the park with more than 400 officers determined to catch the dangerous fugitive. We mobilized our SWAT team out of Phoenix immediately to the Grand Canyon. So within about four hours, uh, we were in the Grand Canyon that night and started doing patrols uh, that night, uh, looking for where he went in the woods to see if we could cross a track for him or run into him. The FBI sets up a command post, leaving no stone unturned. They set up roadblocks at all the entrances and exits. Uh, we actually had helicopter up that was going over the 
edge of the Grand Canyon, looking down to see if he had crawled over. Agents are keenly aware that in just one week, it's the 4th of July, the park's busiest holiday. You're dealing with 10,000 to 18,000 visitors a day coming into and out of the Grand Canyon. So the logistical challenges of setting up roadblocks, conducting the manhunt were, were quite extensive. The National Park fights closing its doors, but has little choice. On June 30th, 1992, authorities close the Grand Canyon National Park to any new visitors. We didn't evacuate anyone that was in the canyon, but we wanted to block the people from entering the Grand Canyon so there would be no more people uh, that could be harmed. And we wanted to monitor everyone that exited so we could see if he tried to leave the Grand Canyon by road. Horning is getting squeezed and needs to make a move. I, I think he's feeling the pressure. I don't think Horning was Rambo. And he was being forced now to live in the woods. Uh, he was very limited in his supplies. So now he's basically relegated to having to steal, steal out of the garbage to get enough food to eat. And I'm sure he's starting to get uncomfortable and tired. But Horning isn't giving up. He dyes his hair blonde to avoid detection. Then, once again, walks right into the open. Independence Day, 11 a.m. Horning approaches two young right British women and forces them into their car at gunpoint. Oh, you're ready to ride. Oh, please get in the car. No, 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 no. I need you in the car. Right. He had gotten in the back of their car, and now he was going to try to sneak out through the roadblocks in their car with them. Horning hides under a fisherman's hat, pointing a concealed gun at the two women. They manage to go undetected through the first two checkpoints. The hostages, when they were going through the checkpoints, I think they were very scared. But the third and final checkpoint is different. Every car leaving the park the is thoroughly searched, and the wait to get out is four terrifying hours long. We were running into so many people, it's hard to search every single car and everything else without having huge backlogs of cars on the road, which we didn't want to do. But we didn't want to let him get out. As Horning and his hostages inch forward, he can taste freedom, and he won't let anything stand in his way. I think Danny Ray made it very obvious to, to them that his gun was out, that he was intending on shooting it out with law enforcement right at that checkpoint. If there was a problem, and if they created the problem, they were going to be part of the problem. July 4th, 1992. The FBI is trying to squeeze suspected murderer and bank robber Danny Ray Horning out of the Grand Canyon National Park, checking every car that leaves every entrance. We thought that if we put enough pressure up there, that he would try to escape from the park. Horning sits in the back seat of a car, holding two hostages at gunpoint, rolling toward the main exit. An armed officer approaches the vehicle and peers inside. We were looking for him, not expecting to see him with a couple of women, uh, and they didn't appear to be distraught. The officer then asks Horning to remove his hat to get a closer look. <clears throat> he had a different description than what we had photographs of and what we had put out because he didn't have a beard anymore and his hair color was different. But he doesn't recognize Horning and lets the car pass. Horning orders his hostages to drive south from the canyon. 
A short time later, he tells them to pull over. He leads the frightened women through some brush, away from the road. Stop, that tree. Both, hug it, one side. All right. They are terrified as Horning pulls out some rope. Okay. Right. I swear to God, I will come back. He tied the two women to a tree, and he told them that he needed about 30 minutes to get away, so they would be eventually be able to free themselves, and then he would be long gone. Uh, they asked, since he was stealing their car, that he leave their luggage, and he did accommodate them. He's, he's leaving our luggage. It's Horning speeds off in their car, straight towards his apparent target, Winslow, Arizona. He took their car and continued towards Williams, east on I-40 to I-17 and south on I-17. During that time, the women got to the closest uh, gas station and told the people what had happened, who contacted law enforcement. Word that Horning has changed his appearance and escaped reaches the FBI command post. Immediately, we put out a bulletin on the description of the car that he was in, and DPS officers uh, spotted the car driving southbound on Interstate 17. When Department of Public Safety officers try to pull him over on the busy interstate, Horning opens fire. He again started shooting. It turned into him firing at the officer. The officer chased him all the way down to uh, Schnebley Hill Road exit on I-17, which is about 25 miles south of Flagstaff. He exited the vehicle there. Horning ditches the car and makes a break for the woods. As the DPS officer comes after him, now there's an, another exchange of gunfire, and no one is injured. But Danny Ray bolts into the into the woods and uh, the band hunt is on again. But this time, Agent Tolhurst and his team are right behind him. We were out searching at the time. We heard that happened and uh, we just got all our gear in the cars and started driving like crazy towards that exit. Uh, we got to that area within a few minutes. Uh, I still had good scent articles. I scented my dog and into the forest we went. Agents set up a mobile command post near Horning's car. As we were trying to figure out what we're going to do first, there was one visible white light uh, off to the west. Um, and I asked uh, the, some of the local law enforcement officers what that was. And they told me that was Sedona. And without doubt, I knew that's where he was going. But the DPS officer tells Agent Tolhurst that it's nearly impossible for Horning to run those 35 miles in the dark. That the terrain was too treacherous, canyons were too steep, and to do it at night would be virtually suicide. What we did is we started forming a grid and uh, boxing off the roads, and then starting search teams with dogs behind them and started chasing them. Bloodhounds pick up Horning's scent and begin running the 35-mile trail towards Sedona. So we didn't act on the light. With so much ground to cover, Agent Tolhurst calls for more dogs. He's determined to wear Horning down. Our plan was to try to chase him. We were going to push him as far as we could with dog teams and try to chase him all night until we could catch up to him. p.m. in Sedona, an older couple notices a man behind their garage. He identifies himself as a lost hiker. The husband points him to the trailhead, but his wife recognizes the man and ducks inside to call 911. A woman said that there was a very tired individual at her porch trying to get some water out of the hose. Now, Sedona is like... 30 miles as the crows flies, but it's through a valley over a mountain. And the debate in the command post was, how could he have gotten this far? Agent Tolhurst decides to hedge his bets. 
uh, we decided to send a, a Border Patrol officer and a dog team uh, to go out to see what they would find. But we continued our search as if that were not 100% verifiable. By now, even the dogs are impatient to find Horning. When you're not successful and you don't make a capture at the end of the trail, dogs and handlers get disappointed. You know, that, that's what we're out there for. Uh, old season dogs, they understand. They want to make that find at the end of the trail. And uh, if they're unsuccessful, sure, they get disappointed. You know, they, they want that paycheck at the end. You know, where's that affection gonna come from? And uh, they're, they're hunting the same as we are. Suddenly, at 2 a.m., a bloodhound named Judy locates her target. Police, let me see your hands. Drop the weapon. Drop the weapon. Horning is lying under the patio deck, asleep. A satchel is lying nearby with a handgun. Give me your arms. Give me your arms. Officers rush in with guns drawn. But Horning is exhausted. And to everyone's surprise, gives up without a fight. There wasn't a whole lot left. He just wanted somebody to give him a place to rest, give him some water. Uh, the dog came up and licked him. He had nothing to say. He, had, he was he was done. After the most intense manhunt in Arizona history, the FBI finally has its man. It's very rewarding, and uh, there's just a feeling of euphoria. I'd like to promote it. Danny Ray Horning is booked into the Coco Nino County Jail on July 5th, 1992. Days later, he's transferred to the state prison in Florence, the very same one he escaped from 56 days earlier. Uh, we were all glad it was over with. Nobody was injured. Uh, no civilians were, were injured. The populace wasn't at risk anymore. And uh, we got this guy back into custody. The state of Arizona extradites Horning to California, where he finally stands trial for the brutal murder of Sam McCullough two years earlier. And my brother, you know, believed in people having second chances, getting second chances. And what this got my brother was we don't have him anymore. On January 26th, 1995, Horning is sentenced to death by lethal injection. Today, he sits on California's death row. He is the scum of the earth. He's you. evil. He's sick.